Now, we join Midgeur as he returns to the Blitz Club. This is a musical pilgrimage for me. I've come to four Great Queen Street in the heart of London's Covent Garden. Now today this area is a mecca for tourists with all the familiar high street shops and bars on the edge of theatre land. But back in 1979, Covent Garden was very different. The market had moved and it was a bit of a wasteland. And this little spot tucked away in a side street was a place which came to define the 80s generation, my generation, and set me on the road to chart success. And it all started right here at the Blitz Club. For me, the Blitz was about a feeling. It was about excitement, about being young. This was a club full of people that were looking for the next thing. I always looked upon it as our version of the Swinging Sixties because you had everyone coming together. We felt part of a real movement in a way. Before the Blitz, London was in black and white and afterwards it was in Technicolor. Outside here, it hasn't changed that much. It's a fairly innocuous four-storey building. It's all painted blue just now. The only thing that I think is kind of recognisable as what used to be the Blitz is the glass awning above the, the double front doors. But uh, back in its day, there would have been a huge sign with the Blitz up there lit up by spotlights. The thing that always struck me about this area back then, there were no cafes and restaurants and big hotels. It seemed to be a fairly grey, dull, bland area with just this one little beacon of light, this Blitz Club, where all these incredible kids used to kind of head for on a Tuesday evening. This time. To travel back to the era when the Blitz was first exploding, you have to understand that London was a phenomenally grey place at that time. Broadcaster and writer Robert Elms was a 19-year-old student when the Blitz Club first opened its doors in 1979. I would see him down there pretty much every Tuesday night. 1979 was the winter of our discontent and there was rubbish piling up in the streets and, and rats running through the gutters. That's the backdrop against which you have to see the Blitz, this decaying city and society. And into that waltz these virulently overdressed young children. Gary Kemp is a songwriter and guitar player in Spandau Ballet. They were one of the most successful bands of the 80s. But back in 1979, they were just a group of five ambitious lads from Islington who met regularly down at the Blitz Club. London in 1979 wasn't this kind of bright young place that we all sort of know and see now. And I think because of that, there was an effort, certainly from young people, my generation, to glamorise their lives and to do that through their clothes and to look outrageous and to look exciting. And I think there was a sense, certainly for me in 1979, a sense of responsibility because we were too young for punk, but this was now, it was our turn. We were kind of getting the baton from them and it was almost 1980 and we had to be the next big thing. I felt the same as Gary and his band. We were young, precocious and full of untrammeled creative energy and we were desperate to make something of ourselves. My bandmate Rusty Egan and his friend Steve Strange realised that our crowd needed somewhere to go where we could try out new styles and listen to the European synthesizer bands like Kraftwerk, La Dusseldorf and Telex, whose cutting edge sounds seemed to represent the future tours. Rusty and Steve started an electro pop club night at Billy's in Soho. When the club relocated to the Blitz, a themed wine bar in Great Queen Street in Covent Garden, the whole scene took off and we became known as the New Romantics. There was a, a sort of romantic element to it. Rusty Egan, DJ at the Blitz. My love of the synthesizer made me seek out tracks that I could play. I played Kraftwerk, David Bowie, Roxy Music. With that soundtrack, with everybody looking the way they looked, it created a kind of special evening. Steve Strange was a sort of ringmaster for our circus. He manned the door at the Blitz Club, admitting his own select crowd. 
Frankly, it was a bit of a clique, and there was no doubt that the Blitz's exclusivity helped to create its mystique. <laughs> 30 years on, and I met Steve at the old Blitz club to remember the scene. Steve, how are you doing? It's very strange, because we haven't seen each other for a long time. Long time, but you haven't changed, I have to say. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell me about your door policy, because it was quite notorious, wasn't it? And yeah. quite brutal. I would hold a mirror up and say, that's why you're not coming in. You look like a prop. I. <laughs> I mean, I think the best move that I ever did was turn Mick Jagger away. <laughs> when Mick Jagger came, this place was like the talk of London and we were getting bands coming in to, to see what was going on. So, you know, it was becoming a very, very in clique and it wasn't just music either. I mean, there was fashion designers, photographers, graphic designers, milliners. It was like a cafe society. It wasn't just a place to be seen. The Blitz Club offered the perfect environment for creative people to experiment with new ideas. One of these bright young things was Stephen Jones, then making hats at St Martin's Art College, now a world-famous Milner with his work on show at the v &A. I probably learnt more about fashion in one year from the Blitz than I did from three years at St Martin's because I saw people expressing themselves through clothes. It was where really my style was established. This was a really weird dichotomy. I was making velvet berets for Steve Strange and almost the same style for the Princess of Wales. We were just doing what came naturally, but looking in retrospect, we can see exactly why it has become such a seminal place. Walking into the Blitz was like stepping out of time. You never really knew what period it was set in. It was a total mishmash of styles and blood genders and makeup for girls and boys. I guess that's why once the press cottoned on to us, they called us the new romantics. A phrase I've never really liked, but which attempted to pin down our style, which embodied a kind of nostalgia for the future. Here's Stephen Jones and Gary Kemp to explain. You know, it was romantic, whereas in the 70s it had all been about sort of Calvin Klein beige knitwear and punk had been all about black rubber. We were all about dipping into historical influences from the past. We were kind of making up as we went along. I suppose the big look then would have been a 50s inspiration, but also the future was an inspiration. You know, you'd see people in kind of sci-fi Amdram clothes, you know, meeting rockabilly. And I quite like that. Definitely a dressing up box of ideas. It's true, anything went at the Blitz Club. My own style at that time was film noir, and I used to go dressed in what I called dead men's clothes, old suits from charity shops. It was all very retro. I revisited those days with my old friend, Rusty Egan. So, Rusty, we're standing in what used to be the old Blitz. Right. Yeah. Of an evening, we'd walk in here, and there's a bar along the right-hand side here, which was the kind of propping up posing area. Yeah, definitely. Then the high street fashion was just rubbish. You had to make it, find it, go to a thrift store, do something about it. Hence, that night when you came here, wow, it was a week's achievement to look the way you look, and you would pose, especially with the background of the music, you know? It would create this atmosphere where you're like, you could be a movie star, you could be on an ocean liner. Next day, back on a dole or back at college. That was a great way of living out your fantasies, really, wasn't it? Shouldn't nightlife be that? Shouldn't it be your fantasy world? You know, can't you just forget your mortgage for a night and have a great time? <laughs> <laughs> the song that became the anthem of the club was Heroes by David Bowie. Oh, we can be heroes Just for one day Just for one day I can dress up, I can actually have a possibility of a future beyond what Britain was offering me. It was a bit like Berlin between the wars. I mean, we were sort of dancing on the deck of the Titanic in a London of deep recession. Gary Kemp again. So I think the kind of overt flamboyance was an answer to it, really. You know, certain working-class kids were obsessed with the shadow that they threw, and that's what really frightened the middle-class press. 